understand what that means for us as Christians, especially, and also as Americans. Um, I've talked to several veterans, and, and uh, they all have different opinions on how to be recognized in public. Some folks, they just want to be able to serve without having to be noticed. Um, and, also, and then some folks are like, you know, I'm okay with standing up and admitting that, uh, that I was a soldier. So what I'd like us to do is, I'd like you to stand if you served in the military or if you were the spouse of a person who served in the military. So if you would, please. Now, church, I want you to look to these folks. They either served or served alongside of their spouse. And I want to take a moment, just a moment of silence, to just honor their sacrifice. And now, if you call the United States of America your home, I want you to stand up. Now look around. A hundred percent of us here owe all of our freedom to the tiny, less than five percent who were standing two minutes ago. Think about that. Everybody now standing owes their freedom to someone who served and many who died. We would not have the right to meet today to worship the God we love if someone did not carry a gun, go into war and die for it. Let's appreciate the freedom we have. Let's honor those who have given everything for us. And let's pray one last time in honor of our veterans. Father, thank you so much for those who choose out of the kindness of their heart to serve this great nation that we call home. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom that they died and served to provide us with. We thank you for the ability to live in a nation that allows us to worship freely. And we thank you, Lord, most of all for this great place, the United States of America, where we can send missionaries to other countries, where we can meet as often as we feel in our homes and churches and public places and pray, read your word and study. And we thank you so much, Lord, for the sacrifice of everybody who made it possible. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated. Children, you can go. So we'll be in Galatians today, 3, chapter 3. Galatians, chapter 3. We're reading verses 1 through 9. If you'd follow along, please. O foolish Galatians, who has hypnotized you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was vividly portrayed as crucified? I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now going to be made complete by the flesh? We talked about this with circumcision and these other things they were doing. Did you suffer so much for nothing, if in fact it was for nothing? So then, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness, then understand that those who have faith are Abraham's sons. Now the scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and told the good news ahead of time to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed through you. So those, of you, so those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. Praise God. We see here that Paul is completely and utterly frustrated. This is a great quote. It says, frustration is the result of failed expectations. So for all of us to wrap our minds around frustration, here's a sign in glass filled with like $100,000. 
3M wanted to promote their security glass, so they threw these signs up all over the place, and they have money in them. And they tempt you. They say, hey, if you can break this glass, you can have this money. And to the utter, so what do you think? Expectations. If I took a hammer to one of these windows, it'd break. That's the expectation, right? To the utter frustration of many, 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 many people, some folks, you know, busted their hands pretty well, hurt their foot, you know, broke a couple of tools. This guy jump kicked it. I don't know what he thought he was going to happen. To their utter frustration, the expectation was glass is going to shatter if you hit it with a hammer. Not so much. So that's to kind of get you an idea of understanding frustration, total and utter frustration. But we see here Paul, <clears throat> he is completely frustrated because he had poured into these folks and he had high expectations. Just like these people with a piece of glass and a hammer. They think, hey, my expectations are $100,000 and then they come home empty-handed. Imagine some of these guys waking up in the morning and saying to their wife or their spouse, and be like, you know what, don't worry about it. I got a hammer. I know where there's a sign with $100,000. We'll be fine. Quit his job, goes there, spends all day, doesn't, comes home empty-handed with no job. I don't think anybody actually did that, but that would be funny. In a sad way, I guess. So Paul's expectation for the Galatian churches were high because he had personally taught these churches. But then he saw them fall into the sin of legalism. It is for this reason he calls them fools. So first of all, the word foolish here does not mean stupid, as we would think stupid, like just inept. They're not so dumb that they missed the point. Here's the Greek word. I'll, I will not bore you with how it's actually pronounced. But the word actually literally means a want of proper application of moral judgment or perception. If you missed that, easily, to not use your intellect. To not use your intellect. That's what foolish means. It doesn't mean that you can't understand it. It means you have the full capability to understand it. You actually have the information presented to you, and you chose to ignore it. You chose to ignore the reason that God gave you and the knowledge that he provided. So foolishness is to ignore wisdom, to do the right thing. He continues, for if you guys are following along, verse 2, he asks, who, who has hypnotized you or bewitched you, if you have the King James? One author has this great quote. He says, false doctrine is, as it were, an enchantment, wherewith the devil bewitches men's hearts. For as through sorcery men's minds are blinded so that they think they see something when they actually see nothing. Like legalism, such doctrines often feed on pride because you've done enough. But Christians are not immune. We know these people are believers because if you look in at verse 2, he says that they've received the Spirit. Yet every Christian that adopts legalism, though they are saved, becomes a stumbling block to new believers and hinders people from traveling down the road to salvation. Stumbling block is one of these things that Christians kick around a lot. It's one of these phrases, oh, I don't want to be a stumbling block. But non-believers come along, they don't understand what that means. But the point is, is we're, going to, we're going to realize here, and we're going to see in Galatians, that the, God's church is made up of individuals. And every individual is supposed to make the path to salvation and to Jesus easy and clear. If you are not doing Christianity correctly, you become a stumbling block. You see this brick here? Somebody walks along the path to salvation and you're kind of offset because your theology's not right and somebody trips and falls. Maybe they leave the path because of you, because you stumbled them. That's what stumbling block is in the Christian faith. That's what he's talking about. And when we become a stumbling block, we become the hands and feet of the devil. We're supposed to be the hands and feet of God, right? But when you become a stumbling block, you're the hands and feet of the devil. You are playing into the devil's plan. We saw last week, we said that the world teaches a works-based gospel. The world tells us if you've done enough, you can be saved. But at the same time, it never tells you when enough is enough. This is the reason the world struggles with insecurity, because they don't know what real love is. So, for example, many preachers today confuse God's people by comparing the church to like a football team. Or they compare the church to like a basketball game. When in reality, Christianity is not so much a team sport in that sense. So what is Paul? Like Paul uses some good metaphors. The Bible uses some good metaphors. So the Bible uses these metaphors. Wrestling, running, track, and boxing. 
The Bible uses some very different sports to describe Christianity. So first of all, Genesis, we have Jacob wrestled with God, and there's lots of references to Jacob's wrestling with God. And then in 1 Corinthians, we have this long verse that says, Do you know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only one wins the prize? Run in such a way to win the prize. Now everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. However, they do it to receive a crown that will fade away. But we a crown that will never fade away. Therefore, I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air, as if you're boxing nothing. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself might not be disqualified. So in these sports, we have, for example, we have the Olympic boxing team. They're a team of individuals, but when they're actually competing, it is the boxer versus a boxer. Then we have wrestling. This is the U of I wrestling team. Again, you are a member of a team, and the team gets points when you win, but at the same time, when you're on the mat, it's you and one other person. This is important for us to understand. God provides his word and instruction. The Holy Spirit provides hope and strength to endure, but it is you, the individual, who takes all of that and makes the decision to apply God's word to your life, to train your mind, to submit to God's will, and to endure hardship if need be. So Paul is calling these individuals fools. And you can't blame the coach if you lose your wrestling match. You can't blame the ref if you lose a boxing in, a bo- in the boxing ring. And you can't blame your opponent if you lose when you're running a race. You can only blame yourself. This is why Paul refers to them as foolish. The wise wrestler, boxer, or runner asks some questions. He says, have I trained hard enough? What is my coach's advice? How can I do my best? How can I do my best? How can I live my best? How can I take every part of my life? I mean, a wrestler, when they're wrestling, when they're not wrestling, they're training. When they're not training, they're dieting. When they're not dieting, they're working out because they want to do their best. But when a wise boxer, wrestler, runner fails, They admit they made a mistake, and they ask, how can I better train? What advice does my coach have for me? And they want to apply it. Uh, Just as a side note, I typed in U of I wrestling, loss. I could not find a single picture of a University of Iowa wrestler losing, so I have have an Iowa State wrestler losing. (laughs) I looked, I looked, and I could not find this. I'm like, I know that some of it, but he has lost at some point. But I couldn't find any evidence of it, so it's an Iowa State guy. Does anybody bother anybody? Okay, good. I, I didn't think it would. So we would, you know, a wise person would say, what, is my co- what advice does my coach have? And we have the Bible to give us advice, to tell us how to live, tell us, tell us how, to, how to grow. If we look here, it says, uh, Paul says to us, don't you know that runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? Does he say you just run because you try or you just do your best or you just kind of go? He says, run in such a way to win the prize. Run in such a way to win the prize. But the Galatians don't want to win. They don't want to do their best. That's why they're foolish. So we back in verse 4. It says, did you suffer so much for nothing if in fact it was for nothing? He's asking them, why haven't you learned yet? How could they have gone through the experiences they had and not learn from them? For this reason, he calls them foolish because they have cast aside wise counsel. They're not wise believers running the race. There's nothing wrong with losing. There's nothing wrong with failure. We're all sinners. But when you fail, when you fall, what separates the Christian from the world is that we're supposed to go, okay, what did I do wrong? How did I end up here? What does God's word say about it? How do I correct it? Well, the world says, maybe blame somebody else, like Adam did in the garden. Remember Adam? God says, hey, what'd you do? And he goes, it was the woman that you gave me. How many, you know, how many women? No, no, you know what? Never mind, forget that. Bad question. 
I don't want to have a whole entire hand raising competition between the men and the women. But you can imagine God's frustration as Adam, put in charge, blames his wife and then inevitably blames God for giving him his wife. So he says, they're not, I says, they are not wise believers running the race to win. They are foolish people being hypnotized by the world and led by their flesh. He calls them fools because he sees a people who were trained in God's word. They were taught by godly men. They were given godly advice. And despite having all of these advantages, being taught by an apostle, they chose to not apply the training and ignored Paul's teaching and clear message of the gospel. So what are some of the things we can learn thus far? It's a big section of scripture. So what can we learn thus far? First of all, Christians can be wrong. Christians can be wrong. Just because you believe something doesn't mean that God led you to believe it. This is a Christian tendency that Christians across the board have. Christians have this unbiblical tendency to believe that whatever they believe has to be true because they believe it. The argument goes like this, and I've actually had people say this to me. They'll say, I have the Holy Spirit. I've been led to believe this by God because the Holy Spirit would never let me believe something that's false. That's simply not true. Evidence right here in Galatians. These are people who have the Holy Spirit. Paul says they do. And they have made wrong choices. They believe wrong things. Galatians shows without a reasonable doubt that Christians can be wrong. Holy cow! Could you imagine? We could be wrong sometimes. And we can even be so wrong and still be saved, but be so wrong that we stumble people. But this also helps us to understand grace and security. Praise God that despite our confusion and stumbling, God still loves us. Despite our poor choices, despite the choices that we make, we hurt ourselves, maybe we even hurt others. As long as you trust God, God promises he'll not forsake you. Which leads us to our next point, is every individual matters, and so do our individual choices. If you can't see this here, it's uh, Jane Goodall. She says, every individual matters. Every individual has a role to play. Every individual makes a difference. So if you look at verse 5 through 7, it says, So then, does God supply you with the spirit of work uh, and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Then he gives us a comparison. Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, then understand that those who have faith are Abraham's sons, and you could add daughters. We are each individual sons and daughters of Abraham, following the path that Abraham has set up. We're following his example as our spiritual father, and we acquire salvation as he did. And we enter into the kingdom through the same covenant that he did. Now, it's hard for us sometimes as Christians to kind of accept this, oh, this Abraham thing. Oh, we're the sons of Abraham. Abraham had many kids. Many kids had father Abraham. Did you ever sing that song when you are growing up? This is the reason why. This is the reason why. If we... Um, we study the remainder of this section, we see Paul quoting Genesis because he's going to show us how our salvation comes from a covenant that not only predates Jesus' death, it also predates the law. In this section of Scripture, we find a single individual whom God has reached out to. God promises that this individual will have a son, and this man believed God's word. So in Genesis 15, 6, we have this. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is the verse that Paul quoted. You'll notice that Paul actually calls him Abraham. It's not a direct quote, but a paraphrase. But Abram believed the Lord, and he credited him as righteousness. Here's the earliest of God's covenants wherein God promises that those who believe, just as Abram, will be saved. For this reason, God tells Abram that he will be the father of many nations. And he says to Abraham, look at the sky and count the stars. If you are able to count them, and you're not, your offspring will be this numerous. Church, you and I, we are the children of promise. We are these children. 
He says, your, your offspring will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. That's us. Abraham had many kids. We are those kids. For this reason, he says here, and, and Paul quotes this verse again, he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Before Moses, before the law, before the nation of Israel even existed, God credited righteousness to Abraham as an individual, not a nation, for simply believing. He trusted, as he took Isaac up to the top of the hill to sacrifice his son, he trusted that God would provide a sacrifice. Abraham was still saved through the covenant that Jesus died for us. But he believed that God would provide a sacrifice, and he was saved. Verse 9, he says, So those who have faith are blessed with Abraham, who had faith. So despite our many faults, God still loves us. But what were the mistakes that the Galatians made, and how can we avoid them? There's going to be some application here. There are two reasons that we can discern from the context. First of all, they missed out on the message because they didn't use the brains and knowledge God gave them. If you were in a library in the 90s, you'd probably recognize this. It says, use the latest high-tech learning gadget, your brain. Thanks, Garfield. We see, that, we see in these verses Paul pleading with them to use their brains. He says, let's re, he's like, wants them to reason together by asking them a series of questions. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of faith of, or by faith? Are you going to be made complete by the flesh? He asked like four or five questions in a row. And this is the thing. They're rhetorical questions. They're questions that shouldn't need to be answered because they should already know because they've already been taught. That's Paul's point. Paul's asking him these very simple questions because they already know the answers. But why wouldn't someone apply God's word to their life? Why wouldn't someone test God in these things as God asks us to? Bottom line is they don't trust God's word. They don't trust God's word. Numbers 14, 11, we find God's people in rebellion as we see throughout the Old Testament, constantly in rebellion. And God asked Moses a series of questions, and in these questions we see the origin of their doubt, and we see the origin of their rebellion. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people despise me? How long will they not what? Trust in me despite all the signs I have performed among them. Trust. Trust is the key to growing, learning, and happiness. Could you imagine a happy marriage without trust between the spouses? If you don't trust a news station, you're not going to believe what they say. If you don't trust a politician, you'll not believe him or her or vote for him or her. If you don't trust a person, you will never open yourself up to really love them. Without trust, love stops. And this is one of the hardest lessons for us as individuals to make, but it's essential to our faith. Because Paul is asking these rhetorical questions because he's saying, why don't you just trust the message, the simple message of the gospel? So ironically, I was, I was writing this sermon and I was reading an article and they were talking about um, conflict between believers. Because imagine Christians have conflict amongst, amongst ourselves. Do you ever believe that? And then also um, conflict between the, between the leadership and the individuals in the church. And one of the points that the guy said was, or the guy or gal, I don't know who wrote it, he said, choose to trust. That was one of the points, choose to trust. Just as Abram chose to trust the word of God concerning the birth of his son and the descendants that would follow, we must also trust God's word with our lives. And, you guys, this is the key, with our futures. With our futures. Abram was trusting God with his future, not just for his today, with his future. And in the same way, our faith involves a daily commitment to choose to trust Christ with our lives. As we're told in Scripture, we must daily pick up our cross. And as we saw last week, Paul says, live by faith. 
So here are the lessons that we can learn and some of the things we can actually apply to our lives. First of all, admit when you make a mistake. You can't pursue God's will for your life if you don't humbly admit mistakes. So really think about this. When's the last time you admitted to making a mistake? And then ask yourself, did I admit the mistake immediately? Or did it take me a while to admit my mistake? We all make mistakes. And even those who are at the highest heights of maturity still make mistakes. Do you quickly and adamantly repent of these mistakes? So for example, if I lose my temper with my children but do not immediately admit my mistake, my children will not learn humility and real repentance. And then I, as their father, become a stumbling block for my own kids because I I refuse to admit my mistake. If you drink too much or you do something inappropriate with your non-Christian friends, but do not admit it and apologize to them, they will not understand what the real commitment to Christ is. How is your life any different? And you, again, will become a stumbling block to your non-Christian friends and family. We must quickly admit our mistakes. Two, choose to trust. Trusting's not easy, is it? So many times we burn bridges or people burn bridges with us. If you want to build that trust, you have to step out in faith and act in trust. And you begin to build that trust back, begin to build those bridges. God will never lie to you. So, for example, we talked about tithing months and months and months ago. And God says that he will bless you if you tithe. He says, test me in these things. Test me in these things. Tenfold, he says, I will bless you. Now imagine. Imagine that the bank up the street had a big sign in his window. And the sign said, I will give you ten times the amount that you invest, the bank. The same banks that in the 30s emptied your accounts. You can't trust, but I guarantee you that if the bank had, hey, we will will times 10 your retirement fund, every one of us would empty our IRAs and we'd transfer them to that bank. I would. If a bank offered 10 times the amount, I'd be over there right now. I take all my money and drop it in there. Why do we trust the bank more than we trust God? Think about it. Why do we trust the bank more than we trust God? How many of us get a warranty for an appliance? We trust the appliance warranty place oftentimes more than we trust God. We trust people more than we trust God. We trust systems more than we trust God. And how many times have people and systems failed us? But God never fails us. God never lies. And God says, test me in these things. Not just in tithing, but just in service. Just in loving him and loving others. Apply his word to your life and just see what happens. Which brings us to part three. Apply God's word to your life. You want to really build trust? Apply God's word and see what happens. Build, you know, if you have a like, marriage counseling, we do marriage counseling on occasion, and we'll have, two, we have a couple in there, and we're like, we have to build that trust. You build that trust, and you might not even feel like you trust your spouse, but you act as though you trust your spouse. You step out in faith, and you live as though you do. Then that trust starts to build. Marriages get healed, and people come to trust each other for real. Whatever you do, the Bible says, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If you have doubts, cast your fears aside. Pursue God's righteousness. Despite your doubts and fears, live in the hope and faith that God has called you to. And praise God. I don't want Paul, I don't want to die and have Paul say, foolish foolish Iowa City or foolish, foolish Midwesterners or foolish, foolish Joshua. I want, to, I want to be able to go there and say, I tried my best. I, want, I tried my best. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you so much for your word. Paul is straight to the point. He calls the Galatians out as fools for not trusting God's word, for falling into legalism. We pray, Lord, you protect us from ourselves, protect us from our pride, protect us from wanting to save ourselves because we can't. Help us to trust your word. Help us to trust your promises that you will be there for us, that you'll never forsake us. And Lord, we ask that you forgive us. We have made mistakes. I have made mistakes. Forgive me. Forgive me for the mistakes I made, Lord, and help me to help me to correct those relationships that maybe I've stumbled people, family or friends. Help me to build those bridges so people can come to know you better and help me to make the path easy and clear so that people can come to know you and travel down the path of salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to serve you in this way, and we ask for your conviction and your strength to do so and the courage to step out in faith and do it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you know what this is? We want to impact the world. This is my way of entering another country without physically going. I want these children to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I just see this fire burning in me that never goes away. You have the hands packing the gifts, putting them in the box, the feet carrying them to the other side of the world, and other hands distributing.